Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining today's webinar, Communicating and Connecting Safety Messages to Hispanic Communities. Part of a long overdue conversation on reaching underserved communities to improve transportation safety. Today's webinar is hosted by the National Transportation Safety Board and will last approximately, approximately one hour and a half. My name is Nicholas Worrell. I'm NTSB Chief of Safety Advocacy. As I said in our webinar in April, we have to intentionally include underserved communities in order not to unintentionally exclude them. Today's webinar is about reaching Hispanic communities specifically, and we have opened this learning opportunity to other advocacy groups who want to learn and grow with us. Back in April, I talked about the need to talk with people without sounding like bureaucrats in Washington talking about them. For NTSB, this concern always include finding partners with expertise in connecting with communities. With only a handful of safety advocacy staff out of a total staff of about 400 NTSB employees, NTSB does advocate by collaborating with groups aligned with our safety issues. To paint the broad, to paint a picture, a broad picture, Hispanics are especially vulnerable as pedestrians and bicyclists, while they are within a vehicle, their risk is closer than that of non-Hispanic whites. Why that is, is not the problem we are solving today, although it is a topic deserving of a study. No, today we are asking how to reach these communities with the best safety messages and practices how to identify and energize Hispanic transportation safety advocates to spread the best safety practices and messages to grassroots. You see, reaching Hispanic means reaching everyone, from Puerto Rico mom living in New York to a retired Cubana in Miami, to a young worker with Mexican roots in rural Texas and many others. So that raises the question, who knows each of these communities best? How do we identify and build bridges with people who know the community best? The administration recognized that as the overall racial and ethnic diversity of the country continues to increase, gaps in racial and ethnic equality persist. Meanwhile, each gap becomes more important as each population increases. Recent executive orders have sought to address these disparities. Today, our four panelists will help us better understand what it takes to communicate and connect with them. Thanks to all our panelists for taking the time out of their busy schedules today to share and add value with us today. I will briefly introduce our panelists now, but we'll put their bios in the chat and on the event page at ntsb.gov if you want to learn more about them. Our first, first we will hear from Alfonso Panea, a bilingual multicultural healthcare communications expert focusing primarily on Hispanic and Latino communities. Alfonso has led initi initiatives with federal clients such as Center for Disease Control and Prevention and the National Institute of Health and U.S. Health and Human Services Office of Infectious Disease and HIV and AIDS Policy and others. We will then hear from Violet Marrero, a consultant with extensive insurance sector experience and a National Safety Council Marion Martin Award winner. Then we'll hear from Jose Alberto Uclis, a public affairs spokesperson for the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration, where he has worked for the past 22 years. Among other accomplishments, Jose has created NHTSA's first Spanish language website. And our final presenter will be Jennifer Mayo, Acting Chief of Consolidated Resource Branch, Public Assistant Division, Federal Emergency Management Agency. Jennifer was also previously Chief of Talent Development for the Federal Highway Administration. And to make sure that we are connecting with you, if you have questions, please enter them in the chat box. Once our panelists have presented, we will take as many of your submitted questions as we can. So without further ado, let me turn it over to our first panelist, Alfonso Panea. Alfonso? Hello, Nicholas, and good afternoon, everyone. Buenas tardes. 
Let me go ahead and share my screen. Okay, so very excited to be here. Good afternoon again, buenas tardes. Uh, and thank you, Nicholas, for giving me the opportunity to be part of this webinar. Uh, my name, as you mentioned, Alfonso Pernia, and I am originally from Colombia, and I am a multicultural communications manager at ICF Next. ICF is a global government consulting technology and innovation firm based out of Reston, Virginia. And I bring over 15 years of experience in multicultural communications working with federal agencies, as well as state and local government clients. I'm fully bilingual, and uh, I love soccer. That's why I am very excited. I live in South Florida, so I'm excited that Messi is coming down to these uh, latitudes. So let's start. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and talk about, give a little bit of an overview of the Hispanic stats uh, so we can understand better our people, my people. Then I'm going to talk about the differences between translation, adaptation, and transcreation to move forward into message versus messenger, something that, uh, that Nicholas was mentioning before. Tone and image use, media consumption habits, and finally, I'm going to give some takeaways for everyone here. So to start, Let's go over some overall information on the U.S. Hispanic population. According to the census, we now represent about 20% of the Hispanic uh, total population, of the U.S. total population, I'm sorry. But unfortunately, we face some additional issues and challenges that put us in a vulnerable situation compared to other ethnic groups. We are a very complex group, and we also are very diverse within. Regardless of all speaking the same language, uh, at least here in the U.S., 72% uh, of Hispanics uh, speak Spanish at, at home. Uh, we're very different. We use different terminologies to communicate with each other. You actually will be surprised if you speak Spanish. And uh, you'll be surprised about all the different meanings that just one simple word can have. And it varies from country to country. And even within the same country, just one word can be or have a very different meaning. So the more we know about the audience, the better. Here are some of the states that are, or at least the top 10 states where we have major presence in population. And, uh, and in each of those cities and those states, there are many stories on how each one of us made it to this amazing country. Each one of us is a, is a different story. And because of this, we, the people that are here in this webinar, we have a huge responsibility to be aware of how diverse we are. So if we want to effectively reach Hispanics, the more we know about each of those specific, uh, specific audiences, the better. Uh, what are some of the things we need to take into consideration when reaching Hispanics? The first and the most important is that the audience must be included in the process of message development. Always the main goal of our communication will be to think as the audience, keep them involved in the process, learn directly from them uh, so they actually can feel respected and appreciated and identify with the end result. Plus, if we listen from them, we're going to be able to get information directly from the intended audience. And remember, just because we speak the same language, it doesn't mean that we are the same. Another thing we have to do is to identify and understand who are the key messages for each community. It is not the same if we are trying to reach U.S. Hispanic in general than if we are trying to reach, for example, a rural Hispanic population or even youth, all right? Depending on the generation, first, second, or third generation, we need to know the more we know about the audience, the better we will be able to connect with them. Generate messages, documents, campaigns 
that actually sound real and emotional uh, and, and that actually create emotional connections. We all have heard about it, that creating an emotional connection is important. But the only way to create a real emotional connection is to uh, project ourselves uh, with the audience. Uh, and the best way to do that is to be real. Okay. Once we make that connection, let's make sure that we actually keep it and grow it. This is not only that, hey, it's Hispanic Heritage Month. Let's do something for the Latinos. And then what about the other 11 months of the year? What are we going to do? So if we intend it, if we are real on our intentions, let's be consistent throughout. And not only for Hispanics, this also applies for all different uh, groups. So if we create that trusted relationship and if we start developing it, then eventually we will become a trusted messenger, a trusted source of information. And we can even drive change later on. So our approach to effectively reach Hispanics is based on audience knowledge, putting always the audience first. This approach allows us to make multiple correct or to take multiple characteristics into consideration. For example, gender roles in our culture, abuelas or grandmothers are considered a great source of information and are well respected. They keep families together and they help to pass on values from generation to another. They're decision makers and they're also influencers in their family. So, uh, for example, for healthy messages, they played a big role or they always play a big role trying to influence uh, their family, for example, to get vaccinated for safety features or keeping the family together. Attitude towards authority and government. Understand where are they coming from? Did they actually escape their country? What are the reasons your intended audience left their country? Poverty, persecution, security issues, whatever the case is, the more we know, the better. Why did they leave? When did they leave? If there's no trust toward the government, then we need to find out how to deliver the message and who will be the most effective messenger. What about a cultural level? Are we reaching first, second, or third generation Hispanics? This will dictate, uh, for example, the language that we will use or the language preference. Third, fourth generation of Hispanics, they probably feel more comfortable speaking English. So regardless of being Hispanic, do we need to create uh, messages in Spanish if we are reaching a population that is fully bilingual and that probably feels more comfortable uh, speaking English without uh, stepping away from their roots? Social norms and habits, for example, unfortunately in South America, as I mentioned before, I'm from Colombia, and uh, there are no very strict child safety regulations. And when we come here to the States, we're being a lot, we bring a lot of baggage okay, and beliefs and misconceptions uh, related to safety. And again, child safety specifically. It's sad to see that kids in Colombia don't wear a seatbelt. They're not put in a, in a safety seat. They drive in the front seat. Uh, it's but it's normal for us, okay? So we have a huge responsibility to start changing people's behaviors and beliefs, and we cannot force it. We should develop and grow this relationship, as I mentioned before, select the right messenger, select the right tone, so the, the message can actually be heard and processed by the audience. Knowing this uh, is that, I'm sorry, before, before I move forward, one thing that I want to emphasize is that language is not people, okay? Only because 
there is an intercommunication to happen in Spanish, as I mentioned before. That doesn't mean that it will work. Not one size fits all for the Hispanic community. And now that uh, we can actually go into translation, adaptation, and transcreation, knowing a little bit about the importance of selecting the message, selecting who is going to deliver that message. Uh, this is a simple chart of the process that we follow at ICF. And the ideal situation is that the message can be drafted or created in Spanish. So it is adapted to meet the audience needs. Adaptation takes into consideration tone and audience characteristics. Transcreation, on the other hand, takes the original concept and recreates it, but it maintains the original intent, style, and tone. And then translation, which unfortunately that's what usually happens on a daily basis, it's done word by word. And it really doesn't reflect the audience nor the culture. It, it lacks a lot of meat. Uh, it, it's just straight up translation with no depth, with no uh, cultural information, okay? And again, unfortunately, we see that a lot. We strongly recommend adapting or transcreating, and of course, selecting the right messenger for this. Message versus messenger. Uh, choosing the right messenger is the most important thing, okay? We can have an amazing campaign. We can have a very effective message with a simple call to action. But if we, if the message is not delivered through the right channels, then we're going to be, we're not going to be effective. And, uh, and we're not going to be taken as a trusted source or as a person with a lot of knowledge. So who are the trusted, trusted sources of information for the Hispanic community? We have the promotoras and community health workers that actually go, they do an amazing job and they go and have a direct contact with the community. They know the community, they're trusted by the community, though they're respected. And uh, what they do is that they build connections. They build, they, they build relationships, they grow them, and they, they sustain them. Friends and family are also uh, trusted sources of information. Churches and faith leaders, some of the community-based organizations, some public figures. It's uh, it's amazing now the role that social media plays in our life. And there are some public figures, some athletes, some uh, reporters, some uh, community members, uh, athletes that can actually get to influence. Uh, our actions, community-based organizations, and public figures. Okay, so again, important to know who we are selecting as a trusted source of information, so our message is delivered directly to the source. I wanted to share with you uh, an example of uh, an amazing campaign that we developed for the Morehouse School of Medicine last year, and. Uh, being able to accurate to have an accurate representation of your intended audience is crucial. As I mentioned before, the more we know about the audience, the better. And this is why I wanted to share some examples of the materials that we develop, again, for the Morehouse uh, School of Medicine. We develop audience-focused campaigns for promoting COVID-19 vaccination among nine diverse communities, African-Americans, Hispanic Latinos, Spanish-speaking migrant workers, Alaska Native, American Indians, Filipino Americans, Native Hawaiians, Asian, and African American young adults with intellectual disabilities. Very diverse, very complex as well. But during the project's first two years, ICF Next conducted formative research to capture unique insights about each one of the different communities to inform the development of each of the campaigns. Formative research included environmental scans of the existing materials, media, messages, and content audits, and over 80 in-depth interviews 
with staff from the uh, the School of Medicine, partner organizations, and other community-based organizations who serve members of our priority audiences. We also did over 20 focus groups with memberships of this audience. And we also did secondary research that included demographic, economic, and other data about each of the priority audiences. We used all of this information collected during research and development and developed personas. So persona is like an audience profile, a very specific audience profile for each audience. And ultimately, all the materials also implemented plain language uh, that will allow us to communicate easier with the uh, intended audience. When we tested the materials with each audience, it was just fascinating to see their reactions and feedback. They were part of the process, as I mentioned before, and they were proud of it. They were so proud to see a reflection of who they truly are in those end materials. So it's complicated, it's long, but it's it really means a lot and it really makes a big difference and an impact. The more we know about the audience, the better. So next time you hear, uh, we need to only translate a document of marketing materials or, or just do marketing materials in Spanish. I hope you remember this and try to go beyond just a simple translation. Some of the media consumption habits uh, I'm going to present here, but I know that Violet will go much more into detail during her presentation later on. It is so considered for most Hispanics that traditional uh, TV and radio are their preferred media. Plus, we are well connected to the internet with 92% of US Hispanic households with access to the internet. Also, what plays a big role in, in our lives is the importance of family. We cannot forget how to integrate our likes and preferences with how we consume media. Social media plays a big role in our lives. And uh, we also, it would be great if we can find out language preferences to see if there's truly a need for bilingual messages. We love music. Connect through us through music. Okay? It's not always the case that, uh, again, if we are developing a message for the Hispanic audience that is mandatory, that is something in Spanish. With that, I would like to give you five takeaways uh, today. The first one, understand the audience you need, history. One size does not fit all. We're not all Mexicans or Cubans or Colombians. We are very unique and uh, we all have a unique process of information uh, and of how we communicate. So take that into consideration. Value it. Language is not people. It doesn't mean that if you are tasked to do something in Spanish, you're going to get everyone's attention. Okay? We might speak the same language, but that doesn't mean that we all can read, understand, and receive information the same way. Number three, there is a complex diversity within the Hispanic Latino audience. Uh, again, I'm from Colombia, and my friends from Venezuela, from Ecuador, from Peru, from the Caribbean, from Mexico. We can all get together. We can speak Spanish. But man, we're different. Okay, we're so complex. And even within each country, the complexity and the and the diversity is just amazing. It's fascinating. So take that into consideration. Don't take it for granted. Again, the more we know about the audience, the better. Messenger can often be more important than the message itself. Understand that we can have strong messages, but if we don't have or we don't know the we don't use the correct channels or the messenger, chances are your intended audience 
will not get nor understand the message. And last but not least, be authentic. Really mean it. If you are putting out a message or if you're sharing a message, a report, uh, marketing materials, or anything with the Hispanic community, explain the benefits or how it affects the their life. Uh, how this information impacts their life and their family. Think about what drives us and how we want to protect that, especially our family. Okay. Uh, so if you want to take Hispanics into consideration throughout the year, not only do it for his for specific dates, do it throughout, do it all the time. And sound realistic. Sound like you really care, or sound like if you are putting this report, if you're putting this campaign, if you're letting them know that you need to use the seatbelt, that you need to be careful when driving your bicycle. Let them know why. And let them know that even though, for example, the message is coming from a governmental uh, agency, it, it is not a mandate. It is not because we are telling you what to do. It is because we care about you and your family. So I hope that you uh, learn and enjoy a little bit this uh, little conversation. And uh, again, I want to thank everybody for your time and Nicola for the opportunity of uh, having me today here. Thank you. Thank you, Jose. Thank you. I really appreciate that presentation and remind us we have to meet people where they're at. It is often said that people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. And um, uh, we're looking forward for some Q&A and some questions. And again, I, as I said earlier, if you have questions, please drop them in the chat box and we'll queue them up once all the panelists have done. Next up is Violet. Uh, Violet, please take it away. Thank you very much. Thank you, Nicholas. All right, I'm just gonna... Uh, Nicholas, looks like the screen share is disabled. Go ahead, Violet. You thank, you. thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, so first and foremost, again, I really want to uh, thank the National Transportation Safety Board for providing a platform for us to support uh, highway safety professionals serving the Latino community. I really appreciate your service. And I hope that this is just the beginning of many conversations that we have with safety professionals about how to effectively reach the community. Uh, I'm gonna focus on effectively communicating and connecting safety messages uh, with the Latino community from a program development perspective. Uh, as I, I've been a program developer for quite some time in the area of traffic safety. I began my, my career actually within the Latino community. So I worked in a number of nonprofits where I served um, supporting families and uh, getting new homes and repairing their homes. I went on to work uh, for a bank and serving our community as well. I also worked with Telemundo in uh, the city of Philadelphia, where I served our commu my community. And then I began working uh, in New Jersey with the Division of Highway Traffic Safety. So I have that governmental experience and perspective where I spent um, over a year, over a decade of my career. And um, lastly, I worked in, in actually in banking and in insurance. Uh, my last position was with the insurance industry, looking at it from the perspective of safety for policyholders. So I feel like I have a rich, you know, rich perspective from um, from all of those different fields. And I'm really excited to be able to share what it is that I've learned in hopes that that will support you in effectively reaching the community, delivering your message and really shifting behaviors. Because at the end of the day, that's what this is all about. Right. Okay, so um, let's get started. So empowering decisions. Um, you know, there's a three-pronged approach we can take to empowering the community with what they need to shift their perceptions and behaviors around safety. First and foremost, we need to educate the community to help them understand what safe, that safety, why safety matters, right? Why is this important to them? And Alfonso touched on a lot of the things that I'm gonna talk about as well, which is, which is amazing. 
Um, you know, and we need to do this for, on a personal level without employing scare tactics, which is something that, you know, I, I feel like the that our, our field is moving away from because we recognize that it's not effective. I think in particular, it's not effective for, um, for the Latino community. The engagement piece of this is really important because we are most effective in empowering decisions when we use a multifaceted approach to communicating with the community. If we're gonna be successful, we need to establish a presence in the community and make a long-term commitment to serve them. This is a community that has been neglected and often abandoned when it comes to services. So we wanna make sure that they understand that we're here, we're here to help and we're gonna stay until that's done. Uh, when we're engaging the community, it's also important that we support them with what they need to carry the message forward. And Afonso talked about this, right? We want them to take this back to their family and their friends, and we want them to tell them why this is important, what it is that they've learned. And so by sharing you know, resources with them to do that, they can carry that message forward effectively. Message and Messenger, and again, Alfonso touched on this, and I want to get into it in terms of program development. You know, we do really need to see ourselves um, and relate to both the message and the messenger. If I don't see myself in a message, it's not about me. If I don't see myself in a campaign, it's not talking to me. And so it's really important that we look at it, look at it from that perspective, whether it's developing a marketing campaign, um, a communications campaign, or an actual program that we're going to be delivering direct, directly to the, to the, to the community itself. You know, and then there needs to be that emotional connection. That, again, we've talked about, right? Um, if we're going to be effective in compelling people to change their behavior, we have to make that connection. And as a community, you know, we're very family oriented, right? And um, our values are closely tied to those roles. So helping us understand how a crash directly can affect our ability to fulfill those roles and provide for our families is really, really important. And I'm sharing that from both a professional and personal uh, perspective. You know, I grew up in North Philadelphia in the Badlands and, um, you know, I'm, I'm Puerto Rican and I had, you know, a big family, big community that was Puerto Rican and we didn't use seatbelts. As a matter of fact, um, I didn't even re realize that they were important. I didn't understand why they were there. A lot of the people around me were not using them. So that message didn't really become clear to me or the importance of it didn't become clear to me until I was a young mother. And I made that aha or had that aha moment where I made the connection between, you know, oh my goodness, if something happens and I'm in a crash, how am I supposed to help my children if I'm not in the car anymore? You know, so I think that's an example of how powerful that emotional connection is once we've made that connection, you know, and we need help in order to do that because we're not aware and I can honestly say that that's what it was. It was a lack of awareness, a lack of understanding. And in those messages, they weren't directed to me, if that makes sense. Uh, we also really need uh, to have advocates to support us in making that emotional connection. You know, we are convinced and compelled by facts and testimonials to support our perceptions and our behavior. So, you know, the most effective way of making that emotional connection is to see and hear from someone like us that has been affected. And I think, you know, effective family members play a crucial role in connecting with communities. Uh, you know, for many years, I've had the privilege of working with this wonderful family, this couple that lost their daughter tragically only hours after her graduation on graduation night. And um, it was due to the actions of a reckless young driver. And so they immediately developed this foundation and have been you know, dedicated to empowering young people for over 15 years, hosting symposiums each year, going out to schools. Their symposiums host like up to a thousand students. Uh, and I've been you know, really privileged to have the opportunity to participate in those events. They share their story and they provide a platform for safety professionals to also share their message, you know, to um, to help young people, young drivers in particular, recognize that how we drive is a decision that we're making and that we are all accountable for those decisions. You know, you can see their immediate connection with the message when you're when you're there in person with these students. And, you know, this is a young woman, their daughter, that looks like them that comes from the same community that went to a school that they know of, you know? And so that 
on the ground, really close connection with families that have been affected, being able to help to enlist their support and helping you promote your messages, I think is invaluable. So um, I, all I would say is like really look into those opportunities when they're offered. Obviously, it needs to be the right person in the right position to be able to really carry the message forward. Again, I think, you know, we, I've been blessed to find those people all night in my, you know, my traffic safety journey. And then there really needs to be a clear call to action. You know, we want people to be clear on what that is, what we're asking them to change, how to change it, and why. And the fact that we are underrepresented and overrepresented, rather, in crashes, injuries, and deaths is something that, you know, we're not aware of as a community. And I think it's a super powerful why. Um, and I'll share a specific example in a little bit. Uh, you know, so let's talk about connecting creative. If you don't have the internal resources to connect with the community directly, engage others to help you. I think it's really important for us to recognize that, you know, we're not all going to be able to do this. We certainly can't do it alone. Uh, a great way to start is with a firm like Alfonso's that specializes in engaging diverse communities. You can also work with Spanish language media and organizations that serve the community. You know, media outlets invest millions of dollars every single year in market research to understand these diverse audiences. And so that you can tap into that when you're developing your program, leveraging it and creating your programs and your campaigns. When it comes to language, I just want to touch briefly on a couple of things because Alfonso did a really wonderful job in, in really talking about this in depth. So, you know, as a program developer, I think it's incredibly important that we use we instead of you when we're delivering and sharing messages. You know, um, I would say I think it's important, really important to be inclusive from that perspective and that and that we are all sharing the same roads. So what regardless of whether or not you are a representation of the community, when you're communicating to the community, you can still use that language because we're in this together and we're stronger together when we're all on the same page. Um, in my experience uh, over the years working with the community and coming at, at it from different perspectives, people seem to be really intimidated by the language piece of it because there's an awareness that as Alfonso talked about, there can be words that are would be incredibly inappropriate to say from one, one dialect to the other, right? From one country of origin to the other. But, you know, thinking of it as like, okay, this is, you know, this is something that should prevent us from communicating or we, we have to create 10 different messages. You know, that's a myth. When I worked in Telemundo, uh, we had a, a festival, I want to say, for every single country of origin. And we we had a booth as a, a you know a TV station at every single one of them because they were all watching Telemundo or Univision. They were all watching their novelas and their noticias. And that's the news or the novelas. And if you have not ever watched a, a telenovela, I would say it's worth giving a little bit of time to. They're wildly entertaining. My point is that the language we share is broadcast language. And so it's important to, to, to look at it from that perspective, to try that on, to see if there is a way for, for you to work with broadcasters, to work with firms in order to come to that common place. It's not to say that you're not going to need to tailor things to specific communities where there are specific problems, but it does help you create an overarching message if you want to reach an entire state. Or you know, if, you, if you're doing something on a national level, it could be helpful. And then normalizing safe behavior. You know, we we need to help all communities shift the perception around um, of a crash being like lightning striking, uh, as opposed to one of accountability for a decision that's been made. And I think it's really helpful to also engage broadcasters and and firms and everyone to make them aware of the the fact that. We need to educate them so that they understand why it's so important to move away from using the word accident to using the word crash so that we can, again, you know, create that sense of accountability for decisions that decision that's made. It's not this isn't something that just happens to people. There are decisions that are made. And then when it comes to imagery, um, you know. I would say one of my biggest challenges, is, you know, that I've encountered in this work has been finding images that depict Latinos doing the right thing when it comes to traffic safety. Uh, I began my career in traffic safety about 20 years ago with the Division of Highway Traffic Safety. And early on, we were putting together a brochure for child passenger safety. And I couldn't find any images of children in car seats that were properly, properly fitted. 
And so, you know, sadly, that's still the case, as you can see in this image here, right? For all of those trained eyes who are child passenger safety technicians, you will see exactly what's wrong in that photograph. So I had to take my own. You know, thankfully, my, my nephew was in a car seat at the time, so it worked out. But not everyone has a nephew. And it's very challenging even today to find stock images that work. So depicting safe behaviors, what you'll end up finding are a lot of images that are depicting unsafe behaviors, which we don't want to use. We want to show people what we want them to do. We don't necessarily need to depict what they don't. we don't want them to do because they get it, right? This is a picture, this picture was really as closest as I could get uh, to, to the chi a child fitting in the proper seat when I was looking at stock imagery. So, you know, it can be very frustrating because it's important that we normalize safety. And to do that, people have to see themselves in those images to connect uh, with what we're communicating. And, you know, I would highly recommend that if you put together a campaign or a program that you really allocate money in your budget, um, that you allocate the resources that are needed in order to uh, produce these types of images so that we can see ourselves in them. Uh, it's, it's really the only way to make that an emotional connection for the audience, which is really essential, again, in shifting their behaviors. Influencing change. So again, this is a program, these are all program development things that I think are really important to have an understanding of. You know, in order for us to influence change, we have to address what people know, how they feel, what their willingness and ability is to change. And you know, I want to use the example of bikes, bicycle safety helmets. So if I'm if I'm developing a program and I'm speaking to an audience of Latinos and I'm thinking about, you know, how I'm going to present this. I want to know how much do Latino parents know about bicycle safety, the laws, the risks, you know, how do they feel and what do they believe about helmets? Maybe they grew up without using them, so they don't realize that this is something important. They don't have any understanding of, you know, how important it is to, for them to actually be properly fitted on their child's head in order to be effective. Um and, you know, are they able and willing to change? So when you're developing a campaign or a program, you know, you can survey people, but there's no way to really know how everyone feels and what they believe, what their willingness and ability is to change. But we do have data. We know that the bike helmets, safety, bike, uh, safety helmets, so yes, bike helmets <laughs> usage is significantly lower for neighborhoods, um, for Hispanic uh, communities, Hispanic children in particular, especially those that are from neighborhoods with greater socioeconomic economic disadvantage, which points to the fact that they are unlikely aware and unequipped to do this. So we have to consider also that the feelings and beliefs about traffic safety for this community can be very different from other, pop other populations. And Alfonso touched on some of those pieces, but I believe in general that this is due to a lack of awareness and an incorporation of these practices into the culture itself. You know, again, it depends on how many generations we've been here, and that could vary different, very greatly from, from one community to the next. Now, we really want to support people in shifting their behaviors with practical guidance and support, along with why they should change their behaviors. The way I approach program de development is to assume that my audience is unwilling and unable to change and that they don't feel or believe that it's necessary to do so. And I do that because from that perspective, I'm creating something that addresses the need holistically. Everyone from the person who's not at all equipped or able, willing, has no knowledge or beliefs, to the person who does have all of those things. You can capture them all under the same umbrella, regardless of their level and ability to do these things. And so I'm going to tie this back to emp into empowering decisions. So the first piece of it that um, we're going to look at is educating. So we want to share information, data, testimonials. This is an excellent place for us to include, if we have the ability to do so, a victim's advocate, perhaps a video of them. I've seen that done in some incredible programs like Impact Teen Drivers. And then we want to engage people. We want to allow them to try on the behaviors that we're asking them to adopt through interaction. And, you know, we have bike rodeos, right, community events, festivals that we can have booths in, things of that nature. And then we really want to support people by providing the tools and the resources that they need in order to continue practicing those behaviors. And in this case, that would be, you know, for an underserved community, this could be free helmets, 
bicycle helmet, um, radio, uh, fitting stations, you know, um, and I would say, I know that the Brain Injury Alliance, in particular here in New Jersey, because they're the ones that I'm most familiar with, they've done an incredible job with this because they understand the importance of engaging the community on multiple levels, not just through a campaign or a program, but really meeting them where they're at in their own communities. And so, and again, preferably with representation of their community to deliver that message. I want to share with you a model that um, I, I love. So when it comes to influencing change, there's this wonderful six-step practice model that was created by Dr. Flora Winston um, from Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. And she's a world-renowned researcher. She's incredibly brilliant and it does a really phenomenal job with this. I have used this in program development and found it to be incredibly successful in terms of shifting behavior. So this, uh, you know, this is an approach that can be used holistically. And the brilliance of it is that it recognizes the need for us to evolve. You know, uh, when we're developing initiatives or campaigns, whether they be programs, messages, uh, et cetera, we can reach this point where we believe we're finished. And, you know, with this approach, we go into it much differently because you know, we're we're okay with building something that can change so that we're open to being wrong. And the point is that, you know, we're not going to get it perfect, probably really not going to do so on the first try, but we can evolve the program and it allows us to adapt quickly to change what we need to in order to continue to move that needle in terms of behavior. So I'm going to walk you through the steps. The first is to identify what our long-term vision is. What is our goal? So, you know, whether that is to increase the, the, the number of children who are using bicycle helmets or the percentage of, of children who are properly seated, reduce the number of injuries, crashes, fatalities. This is our long-term goal. And then it's to identify the behavior linked to that key outcome. What is it specifically that we need people to do in order to reach that long-term vision? Then we identify constructs that are uh, related to that. So these are the things that influence the adoption of behavior, and they would be knowledge, feelings, beliefs, ability, and willing to change, willingness to change. And then we, uh, sorry, <laughs> we we develop the content. And so the content is based on all of those things that we've talked about. We want to make sure that we address their knowledge, their beliefs, their ability, and their willingness to change. And then we measure the program. We want to measure because, and I would really highly recommend doing free post and follow-up surveys, if at all possible, because we want to know where people are when they get to us. We want to know where they're at immediately after. And then we want to know what the long-term impact is of the intervention that we have created. And finally, we refine it. We use this data in order to tell us what's working, what's not working, what we need to refine, what we need to improve, what we may need to add, what we may need to take out. It's incredibly important to gather that information. And I also think it's helpful, especially if you're doing something in person, to gather that feedback from your audience. And I have found, you know, in my experience, people, when they're receiving a service like this, especially the Latino community, they're going to want to talk to you afterwards. And they're going to share things with you that will really help you make improvements and refine your programs so that you can be as effective as possible. And again, reaching those goals, moving the needle, supporting the community. And, you know, lastly, and this is something that Alfonso also talked about, it's about engaging the community. Uh, as I shared, I worked in community-based organizations, you know, with definitely with community-based organizations for my entire career. And, you know, I've worked with a lot of them to provide services, including housing, like I shared. They all share the mission to serve the community. And they really embrace, you know, agencies and organizations that share that mission, provided that they are sincere and genuinely committed to doing so. And I would say that the same stands true for faith-based organizations. You know, I've worked with a lot of those as well over my career. And I have found that, you know, they're they have the same goals that we do. They want to see, you know, their communities flourish. They want to see that people are safe. They don't want to lose lose members of their community. So you get an immediate buy-in with these groups. And then I would say, you know, it would be advantageous to use cultural events, like we talked about with festivals, fairs, 
whatever it is that you can you can do in order to have an actual presence in the community at a place where they're already present is going to be advantageous to you and forwarding your message and accomplishing your goals. And lastly, I think athletic clubs are something that kind of like get left out a lot of times, but they're a great resource in that if you can connect yourself with clubs and be able to disseminate your message, get coaches involved, then they can share these messages with their um, with their parents that are participating and the, the students that are participating. In particular, when it comes to child passenger safety, I think this is something that we really need to tap into. And so I'm going to talk to you through, through our takeaways. Let's empower decisions and influence change. You know, don't tell us what we need to have to or should do. Give us the why and the how and the resources to do so. Uh, make sure that we see ourselves in your message and make sure you make an emotional connection with us. Apply best practices to develop your campaign or program and measure your results. And engage partners, whether they be specialized communications firms, nonprofits, uh, faith-based organizations in the community or the media, engage others to support you in really furthering this message and this cause. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Violet. I appreciate it. appreciate your time. Very good presentation. Looking forward to the questions. Again, if you have questions, please submit them into the chat and we'll get them queued up for once the panelists have uh, finalize their presentations. Um, next up is Jose. Jose, take it away, sir. Hello, hello everyone. Um, it is indeed a pleasure to be part of this um, webinar. Um, and I must say that uh, both uh, Alfonso and Violet made my life easier uh, because a lot of the ideals and the right way to do things that you brought up are, is stuff that um, we at the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration, NHTSA for short, have been using through the many years. Uh, my name is Jose Alberto Ucles. I'm originally from Honduras in Central America. Obviously, Spanish is my first language. And uh, what I have found is that after being with NHTSA for over 22 years, uh, it is still a, a job that fills my heart with joy to be able when I'm on a highway on the road or driving around the city, to know that we, uh, NHTSA, touches and helps save so many lives out there. Um, everyone in a, in a car, everyone driving a motorcycle, riding a motorcycle, uh, riding a bicycle, walking. I mean, we affect all those lives uh, in so many different ways. Um, through to the year through the years, I have wanted the dream that came through finally in um, 2021. When um, in 2020, sorry, when the NHTSA website was unveiled, NHTSA en español. My background is basically on communications, uh, public relations, uh, and I am the uh, Spanish spokesperson for NHTSA. So when it comes to interviews and trying to reach the Hispanic population, it is my pleasure to be able to deliver those safety messages that are so important to me, um, especially like some people mentioned before, uh, from the countries that we come from, uh, uh, traffic safety is not viewed in the same way, like in Honduras and other countries where many friends come, it is not obligatory to wear uh, seat belts or to put children in the appropriate uh, car seat, uh, in the back seat, or the views of machismo are greater uh, when it comes to, oh, I can drive with a few uh, beers or a few drinks on, or yeah, marijuana won't affect my driving. So obviously, there, there is a lot of misconceptions we need to work on. And that's what I'm here to talk about, what we have done at NHTSA. Um, to, to us and to me, and I think uh, definitely Nicolas and his wonderful team at, at NTSB is for doing this webinar that helps us all uh, communicate, connect, engage, and educate other people on how 
to best reach our Hispanic uh, population and Hispanic community, which, as we all know, is very diverse. We don't fit in one little box. <laughs> we come from many, many different countries. Um, I'm not sure how familiar you all are with the mission of NHTSA, but we are really a small agency with a gigantic task to help save lives. Uh, like I said before, what may be on the road, maybe somebody bicycling, somebody walking. Um, what we are involved are, and you might have heard some of our campaigns is, for example, Click It or Ticket, which is our safety uh, bell campaign that you see the PSAs and, and ads all over the place, and even in station, um, in bus station uh, 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 hubs or on the roadways, or, you know, uh, you drink, you drive. Um, there's many, many things that we do. And I think sometimes the public forgets that we do other things uh, besides the drunk driving campaigns, the distracted driving, anti-distracted driving campaigns. We also are something that is very near to us is also being able, as uh, enacted by Congress, to do the federal standards for automobiles and that are manufactured in this country or admitted into this country. And another thing <clears throat> that is very important to us is the fact that manufacturers are held accountable when it comes to recalls. If there is a safety defect, we are the agency that helps to make sure that all your vehicles are repaired properly. And it was an interesting thing because back in 2000, when uh, NHTSA was at the top of its game with the famous um, um, uh, tire, uh, tire issue, I was hired. Um, so it, to me, it was a great pleasure uh, to be able to come and help with the Firestone tire recall that needed to have uh, outreach to the Hispanic community. That was, at that time, the Firestone tire recall was very big. As you have seen it now through the last few years, we have the big recall also of Takata airbags. So that is something that we have been very involved in so many different levels. And the same in the, on the same token as with Firestone, we, or my obligation, my pleasure, is to try to let our Hispanic community know that those uh, Takada airbags need to be replaced. So let me walk you through, I'm not going to go into all the details because I think um, between uh, Frank and Violet, they did a great job at the nuances of reaching the right uh, um, uh, the right Hispanic uh, consumer and how to do it. But to us, I want to talk about the commitment of my agency. Obviously, my dream when I was hired was that there would be a Spanish version of NHTSA.gov that now we finally have, which is uh, NHTSA en Español. Uh, just a reminder to everyone, Rome and the world wasn't built in one day. And, you know, we all need to learn how to crawl, uh, then walk and run, and then to maintain that speed while we're doing it. So it might have taken some time, but we are glad we're here. Um, and one of the important things um, about NHTSA when I first was hired was the engagement that we started doing with both um, stakeholders, um, uh, partners across the country. NHTSA has 10 regional offices, which also have Hispanic uh, uh, outreach components. So we are able to disseminate our materials to them. At that point through the years was through our NHTSA traffic safety marketing materials that had to deal with the campaigns that we do year round, campaigns on drunk driving, distracted driving, speeding campaign, um, hot, uh, ch uh, children fatalities in hot cars, hyperthermia. Um, there's so many campaigns that we do across the year. I mean, on top of an, our annual holiday, don't drink and drive campaign or for Thanksgiving buckle up or, you know, there's so many, so many things that we do that we make that management, my leadership makes sure that we have a Spanish component involved in that. 
And for that aspect, we have hired and we have currently a Spanish uh, marketing firm that helps us uh, with focus groups that we have been doing all along, which I think Frank mentioned is something very important to be able to educate ourselves with how does this uh, a younger group of men in Texas or California or New York in a focus group feel about certain terminology and words that we will be using in those uh, PSAs, um, in those ads that we put out that we make available to our partners. It is very important to have their buy-in also and know that we have. So, and then we went one step uh, uh one would step above. We created what is a very Nizza-centric um, Spa- uh, English-Spanish glossary. And again, like Frank said and Violet said, it's not about just translating. It's about adapting. It's about using terminology that everybody can understand. Like it's been said before, one of my favorite lines when I first came to Nizza is that our Spanish has to be like a Telemundo Univision newscast, like what the news reporters use, because no matter what differences there might be in language, we can all understand what the news are telling us in Univision and Telemundo. Now, like somebody said, telenovelas, that's a different thing. That's a lot of different dialects and and, uh, idioms that they use. But one of the main things with traffic safety uh, marketing was that it gave us an idea of what a big need we had that our website should also reflect that Spanish content. And let me not get ahead of myself, but we also, or part of my task is that as I, I was hired, was also to make sure that we were able to put out press releases, um, uh, consumer alerts for our Hispanic audience that would warn them about campaigns that we had, that we were doing, or if there was some mega recall because cars were catching on fire. So it's a very dynamic, evolving. We have to be ready for action if something happens with cars whose batteries are burning, uh, many different issues that occur in in the traffic safety world that we live in. So that was one of the first steps. And that glossary helped us keep that language uh, standard for NHTSA so we could be able to share it with our partners, our advertisers, and help create something that was a solid message. On top of that, we also developed a style guide for our internal use, which may, makes us, when whether we are working on the website where we're, we're putting a press release or we're doing something in traffic safety marketing in all those multiple areas, we have our campaign name solid and we have the way that we're doing um, our, our, our leadership. Now, one thing that is very important, as you're aware, uh, NHTSA is the, uh, the agency that maintains the data on traffic fatalities. And our latest fatalities in 2022, there were 42,795 Americans who were who died in traffic crashes and millions more were, were, were injured. So those are big, big numbers when we're talking about fatalities. And as you would understand, obviously our Hispanic community is highly or overly represented in those fatalities. Um, I'm going to give you a five-year framework from um, uh, 2016 through 2020. 65% of Hispanics that were killed in traffic crashes were obviously riding in a vehicle. Something that is very sad to me even to this day is that almost half, 47% of those Hispanic passengers that were killed in those vehicles were not wearing a safety belt. And that is sad to me. But even sadder to me, and it it is something that still grinds in me, is that 44% of Hispanic children who are 14 and younger, who died in those traffic crashes, were not in the appropriate, in the correct car seat 
for their age and, and weight in the vaccine. And one of the things that we still see a lot in this country for Hispanic is that over 34% of Hispanic that die in traffic fatalities, sadly, have a, a 0.8 and above um, a blood alcohol content. And in this stats, we as in this data, we also find that younger generation of Hispanics between the ages of 21 and 34 are highly represented in these fatalities. And also we find out that a higher majority of them are male in that age group. So obviously when we uh, get campaigns underway, we try to make sure that we are reaching this community, uh, this, this groups in um, when it comes to trying to help them, educate them to save their lives. And a lot of people would say, but in our countries, it's not our habit to buckle up. It's not our, our. Um, uh, we can drive impaired. But I think slowly and surely, as we saw before the pandemic, numbers were going down. Sadly, during the pandemic and after the pandemic, there was this rash of higher fatalities because people were driving a little more erratic uh, people were speeding, people were driving more aggressively. But thank God we're starting to see a um, a return to lower numbers. So that to me is important that we all keep in mind when reaching to this community. And like I said, in um, actual 2019, my agency, my leadership, which I'm very thankful for, uh, did a commitment that we would create a a mirror, a, I call it a mirror, but it is a complementary website to NHTSA in English, our website, and it will be called NHTSA en Español. And so then we went on the task of working on that, and that doesn't happen overnight. There's so many things in play, and I must say uh, that on September 15 of 2021, uh, during Hispanic Heritage Month, we were able to unveil the first ever Spanish language website, Nietzsche en Español. I must say that I got inspiration and got encouraged when I saw the Spanish websites of the National Institute of Health, uh, when I saw FEMA's um, uh, Spanish website, the IRS Immigration, that did inspire and the education that followed for me and the team that is behind NHTSA and Español has been great and we are evolving. And the one thing uh, you have to understand if you want to take an, an endeavor like this is that it takes time and it takes commitment and it takes involvement of a big team. We're lucky and blessed to have the, the support of the entire NHTSA leadership in doing this and the money behind to do it. And also, uh, both in the marketing aspect, uh, a couple of other translators that work with me. We have even a Spanish uh, digital um, a, a, a team member that actually is helping make even our uh, website more dynamic because things change every day. And, uh, and also that we have an amazing in-house digital team that helps us with that in a marketing team. Um, now, one thing is, how did we get there? And that's, there were some difficult questions that we needed to answer. And as everybody has said about best practices, when doing needs in Espanol, we had to bring the best practices that we had done for our English website. And that meant a few tough questions. First question was software. At the point that we started this back in 2019, there was Drupal 7, which is a platform that could handle some of the language. But we decided that if we waited a little bit longer, that there would be Drupal 8, which would be a little better at doing a more consumer friendly and easier to navigate website. And in between that year, we were able to go page by page in the subject areas, as you will see from the um, shared slide uh, in the comment box, that we created a Nitsa en Español that has all the topics that are of high interest that are in our English website that are in Spanish. Obviously, 
It's an adaptation. Uh, we tried the imagery is important to us, like both Violet and, and Frank said. So we try to make sure that we as Hispanics are represented in, in that, um, in, in our Spanish website. Now, as you all know, and if you look at the English website, the English content is humongous. So as everybody would say, you know, we cannot do everything and we cannot be everything to everyone. So sometimes some tough decisions had to be made as to do we translate everything? Obviously, the answer was no. We need to do content that is important to the health, to the benefit, to the survival of our Hispanic communities. So that would be uh, seatbelt use, child passenger safety, not drinking and driving, distracted driving. Obviously, the recall is something important that we needed to educate our Hispanic community as to that there are resources for them to look out, look up their VIN number of their vehicle and see if there is an actual recall going on and that they have the right to have a free repair. On top of that, our Nitsa in Espanol has a very prominent section where the Hispanic um, um, community or Spanish speaking public can actually call out for free our hotline and be able to talk to a Spanish speaking uh, operator. And on top of that, through the computer to be able to also uh, do a online communication, asking questions, having them look up if they have any recall and to be in, in contact. They're able also to sign online to be able to receive information about recalls on their respective vehicles. So that is something that I think uh, NHTSA has done right, is making communication and being able to be in touch with the Hispanic community. Another question which has been talked in many different ways today is language. We are totally in agreement with what Frank and Violet said, and it has to be a, a Spanish that we all can understand. So I won't dwell in that too much. The one thing I would, I would mention, which I think they also did mention, is that we highly do not recommend uh, using um, translation software. You have to have an actual Spanish speaking person be involved so they have the nuances of what we're saying. Again, the way we do the use of language is important. We try not to be Uncle Sam telling Jose and Maria Pueblo, usted tiene que hacer esto. You have to do this. No, we're here to engage. We're here to educate. We're here to save your life. So the use of a friendlier approach is very important. Also, respecting the culture and values of our Hispanic community. As everybody has said to me and to all of us, family is, familia es lo primero. So it's about making sure that we save their lives and we save our lives so we can see them grow and we can all live a long, healthy existence. So those are some of the aspects that are important to us. We also did find that 72% of Hispanics in this country obviously speak Spanish at home. Obviously, for teenagers or people within the 21 to 34 uh, age group, uh, their, their consumption of media might be in, in the English. So we make sure that they are represented in our PSAs. In other words, that there is a Hispanic. And again, there's a variety of races within us Hispanics. So we try to make sure that that is represented. But our Spanish website is also for the older generations who might not speak a fluent English and they can come and learn more. They have become very useful because in every press release, in every um, consumer alert, we make sure that we put a link to our Nietzsche and Espanol, so both the media and the public can learn more about the issues they are interested in. So that, to me, is a very valuable aspect of Nietzsche and Espanol. Now, the one question you all might ask, and everybody has different capabilities. We're blessed that Nietzsche 
Office of uh, Consumer and Communications, Consumer Information and Communication, that we have a robust team and we're building a robust team in Spanish. So the next big question was, do we do this in-house or hire a contractor? We decided that between my 20 some years of experience, a couple of other Spanish um, speakers who work in um, adaptation of language and marketing, and then my boss, who is a fluent Spanish speaker, uh, that we would do it internally. And even our digital team was very patient of working with me almost daily uh, in making sure all those pages were done with the important information. And by that, I mean that we created the safety messages, the background information on each of the issues. Um, obviously, we cannot translate every report, every research, or every data traffic safety facts that we put out a year because we don't have the bandwidth or the personnel. But when they are mentioned in the Spanish website, there is a little bracket that says in English. So like that, people are aware. So that's something important to take in account when you're doing this. Um, and again, I underscore that we did it internally and we are a, a, a team that is always on top of those subject matters, which makes it easier for us to adapt and change something in, in a blink of an eye. So it is very important that you have an internal team that is committed both to the mission of the agency and to saving lives and working and going the extra mile. Now, one thing that, it, that we made sure with doing it in Espanol is that it would be an easy access. In other words, you would be able to just type NHTSA in Espanol and the website would pop up. Or you could go to uh, NHTSA.gov in English and then on the right side, you can see uh, uh, the change of language, English, Spanish. So that's something that we made it accessible and it's a consumer friendly and easy to navigate a uh, website. So let's keep that in mind. Um, so good, good news is that about a year later in 2022, we had over a million hits at our uh, Nits in Espanol website. So needless to say, we are very proud of it. I'm going to give you a brief synopsis of what we have, which would be the, the sorry, a um, our, our main resources that we have. The educational and public com service campaigns would be in NISA's traffic safety marketing site. Um, obviously, we also have the media outreach that we do when it comes to press releases and consumer alerts on subjects that are happening. The social media outreach that we do, we do it for our campaigns. So we do target a specific ads in Spanish to Spanish speaking groups of audience or in English also. We also have found, found that this is very successful because of targeting capabilities that we get offered through paid platforms that we use. And we are constantly looking at ways to improve our social media outreach. Obviously, Donitsa Safety Hotline, which is 1-888-327-4236, is a good source for Spanish-speaking people who want to learn if their cars have a recall or where to find information. Also, the live feature in Spanish that is available on NHTSA and Espanol, and all this information would be on the chat at the end of this com uh, conversation. So, and again, NHTSA and Espanol is a great source for traffic safety information. Now, challenges, people talk about challenges, money commitment, technical platform options, Spanish speaking team that will make it a reality, and then the time and commitment that it does. Now, key takeaways. This to me are interesting, and I thought it would be three or four. You have to believe the importance of your life-saving mission to start. Know the information and content that you have to offer. Know your audience, their cultures, their values. Use plain broadcast language. Make it accessible and easy to navigate. Six, know your tools, website, maybe press releases, social media, hotline. And then you need to get 
buy-in and support from your management leadership and the team that you work. And once you do it, you have to commit to it, evolve with the times, and continually maintain and sustain it. More importantly, be authentic and credible and engaging when you are communicating in trying to continue to saving lives of our Hispanic community. Thank you very much. Thank you, Nicolas. Thank you very much, Jose. We really appreciate that wealth of information. We're getting a lot of questions about where they can find this information. So what we'll do is drop um, the website in the chat. Uh, you provided that so folks can um, access that as well. And we're also getting some questions from you about, um, from the panelists about the presentations. Hopefully I'll get all the presentations from the panelists and I'll drop those on our event page on our website. Uh, without further ado, let's uh, turn it over to Jennifer so she can wrap us up and wrap it up and bring us home. Thank you. Jennifer, I can see your slides, but can't hear your voice. You might be still on mute. Still can't hear you yet, uh, Jennifer. You can see your slides, you're good to go. Say something. Can you hear me now? Yes, yes, I can hear you. Loud okay, loud. sorry about that. No problem. Um, no problem. <laughs> I was sharing my screen and I could not share anything else. <laughs> All right. Uh, <laughs> All right. Um, well, thank you, everyone. And thank you, NTSB, for the opportunity to present today. Um, this is a tough act to follow um, after having such great panelists today. Um, a bit about me. Um, so I have a very uh, diverse background. Um, I have um, a so I started my career out in public relations and advertising. Um, then after that, I became an attorney. And then recently, I got my master's in um, industrial and organizational psychology. So um, with that, uh, I have had a very long and interesting and diverse career as well. I have worked in, I have private sector experience. I have worked um, in advertising and public relations as a creative director, um, as an attorney. I'm also a professional uh, coach. I've worked in human resources and I have public sector experience specifically in Puerto Rico. I am born, uh, I was born in Puerto Rico, so I am Puerto Rican. So I have a lot of uh, public sector experience uh, as a chief counsel in planning and environmental issues. I was also inspector general for a while there. Um, and then I also have a uh, federal government experience uh, with the Department of Transportation. Um, I was the uh, assistant chief counsel uh, for Federal Highway Administration. Uh, my colleagues at DOT, I miss them very much. I was also the chief of talent development uh, for the Federal Highway Administration. I worked a little bit with FAA and I am currently with the Department of Homeland Security, specifically with FEMA. Uh, so all that to say, um, it was very interesting to me when I got invited to be part of the forum today because I feel I not only have worked in transportation, but I have seen, uh, I have worked a lot with um, Hispanic and Latin, Latina and Latino communities, uh, both in Puerto Rico and in the mainland. Um, so a bit of a disclaimer, I think the information that, that, um, that, that I have for you today is a little bit oversimplified in the sense that connecting with Hispanic po populations, Hispanics and Latinos, which are not the same, uh, is obviously a very complex proposition, which requires careful study, ongoing engagement, and authenticity above all. Um, another thing that I think we, we need to focus on um, that I'm not going to talk about today, but is generational differences or even cultural differences within our community. So um, like, I think it was Violet who said, uh, mentioned, you know, we have different generations of Hispanics and Latinos in the United States. So we have, we might have 
um, first generation, second generation, third generation, some speak Spanish, some are much more comfortable in English. Um, so, and have grown up with different expectations and different um, information. So I think that's very important to also um, keep in mind when we're trying to connect with um, our Hispanic communities. ¿Y por qué? ¿Por qué? Why? The question, ¿Por qué queremos engage the Hispanic community in transportation safety initiatives and other initiatives? Um, so first of all, as others have mentioned, the Hispanic community in the United States is a very diverse and growing population. Um, it, they represent us, we represent a significant and rapidly growing demographic in many regions. Uh, by 2020, Hispanics accounted for approximately 20% of the U.S. population, and the numbers continue to rise every year. And in fact, I, like, I always like to say this, there is an entire U.S. territory with over 3 million individuals that is sometimes forgotten from the statistics, um, and that is Puerto Rico. Uh, we're a U.S. territory, and most of the people that live and work here um, their main uh, language is Spanish. So it's something that we have to keep in mind when we are, um, especially in the federal government, when we're working with Puerto Rico, we have to understand, we have to keep that in mind in, uh, in order to be able to engage um, and communicate effectively. Um, for example, when I was assistant chief counsel at the Federal Highway Administration, I had to remind, um, so we were working on very, uh, complex regulations that even for English speakers, um, English um, speaking uh, governments, state governments and local governments, it was difficult for them to understand our regulations and, and, and what they needed to do. So now imagine having a territory like Puerto Rico where they're getting um, the regulations that they need to follow from the Federal Highway Administration, they're all in English, and they and they have that barrier, they have the language barrier, they have to navigate those waters. So it was really interesting for me as Assistant Chief Counsel, I was usually reminding my colleagues, like, you know, if we're going to do a webinar, if we're going to put out like a one pager or some sort of guidance on how to follow these regulations, it's just really, really important that we have something in Spanish and that we sit down um, and, and understand what that means for Spanish-speaking communities. Um, now at FEMA, even more, right? So we're working with um, disadvantaged communities um, right after a disaster strikes. So we have to communicate very clearly what it is that they need to do, what steps they need to take to be able to get uh, the assistance that they need. So, and even prepare for disasters, how to prepare for disasters. So um, I think I'm, we're very lucky that FEMA has acknowledged that. And we have a lot of, we have a website and we have a lot of materials in Spanish uh, that help us do that. Uh, but yeah, but all in all, engaging the population ensures that these initiatives, government initiatives reach a large and diverse group of people. The second reason del por qué or the why is the disproportionate impact. Hispanic communities often face higher transportation safety risks due to various factors that have been um, talked about today, including language barriers, limited access to resources, unfamiliarity with local traffic laws, all sorts of reasons. So engaging these communities directly addresses the disparities and promotes safer transportation practices that in the end benefits us all. Um, cultural rebel, relevance. Hispanic communities have um, different cultural values and norms that influence behaviors and perceptions of safety. So by understanding and incorporating these elements into transportation safety messages or any other message, really, it becomes more likely that the messages and interventions will resonate with the target audience, leading to an increased compliance and awareness. And again, not just for safety, not just for transportation safety, but also when it comes to compliance of different rules and regulations. Um, trust and collaboration. We live in society, we live together, we have to trust and collaborate with each other. So building the trust with Hispanic communities is essential uh, for overall good communication by actively involving community leaders, organizations, 
influencers. There's lots of influencers in Spanish nowadays, now that we have the TikTok and the um, Instagram and all those things. Let's seek out those influencers that speak to the Spanish community and engage them and incorporate um, some of our messages into their messages. Um, trans transportation safety initiatives can benefit from can benefit from the expertise, the local knowledge, the networks that these groups and individuals have within the Hispanic community. Um, collaborative efforts enhance the credibility and effectiveness of safety messages um, overall. Um, the other why uh, positive public health impact. Um, again, these messages directly impact public health outcomes. And Hispanics are a huge part of the population. So engaging these communities help reduce uh, fatalities, uh, injuries, and it contributes to the overall improvement in, in public health and well-being. Um, and it also gives them, and, it, and, and this has been mentioned before today, it empowers these communities to take part in these initiatives and promote safety for all community members. Um, and lastly, economic considerations. Safer transportation practices lead to reduced healthcare costs um, associated with injuries and fatalities. Um, and promoting safe tra transportation can enhance access to education, employment, and other opportunities for these marginalized communities, which contributes to the overall economic growth and development um, of, of our society. So I think. Again, this is a very uh, short uh, list of the whys. Why should we care and why are we doing this? And this is why I'm so happy that NTSV is actually promoting um, initiatives and webinars like these because it goes to the why. It goes to the why is this important? So the three real quick takeaways that I think I would, um, and this again, it, it, some of this has already been said today, but I think it's really important uh, when you're trying to reach the Hispanic and Latino communities that you are, uh, that you understand the values uh, related to Hispanic uh, and Latino communities, uh, that we make an actual authentic effort to overcome language barriers and that we implement engagement strategies like the ones that have been discussed today to make sure that we are being inclusive. Um, in terms of the uh, cultural values, um, and again, I'm, some of this has been said already today, but um, traditionally, uh, Hispanic and Latino uh, communities have a collectivist orientation as opposed to individualistic orientation. So families are very important. Um, community is very important. Group identity is very important. That's why you see all this like Puerto Rico, La Parada, Puerto Rican, and the Puerto Rican parade, and you see our flags everywhere at this play because community and group identity is just really important to us. Uh, the family unit is highly valued. Decisions are made and actions are made with consideration to the well-being not of individuals, but of the entire um, uh, family unit. Uh, community connections are just really, really important, especially for those people that have um, that have uh, come from other countries into the United States, and they form these close knit communities because they 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 help each other. They help uh, make sense of the world around them. So these connections are really, really important. Um, so communicating with them, giving them that sense of belonging, that they are part of the solution, that they can be part of the solution to transportation safety and other societal um, um, issues that they're dealing with. It's just really, really important. Um, and this group identity plays a crucial role in shaping their behaviors, their attitudes, decision-making processes. So, um, and then to, to how, how do we do this? How, would, how do we engage? We talk about communities, but how do we engage and how do we recognize that? How do we respect and honor uh, the significance of family and community? Um, it can it can be done in various ways that have been mentioned uh, before today, but it can involve incorporating family oriented messages and activities uh, that emphasize safety and well being of loved ones. And I'm going to give an example at the end of my presentation uh, from Puerto Rico. Actually, uh, engaging community leaders and influencers, like I mentioned before, uh, religious organizations are sometimes very important to some Hispanic communities. So. 
um, engaging the community in the planning process and in the implementation of initiatives and explaining compliance um, issues are, is also very, very important. Authority, we have mentioned, I think it was mentioned before, the respect for authority. Authority figures such as um, elders, community leaders, and maybe sometimes people in positions of power. I know, for example, in Puerto Rico, people, um, it's like a love-hate relationship. They 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 say they, they, they don't like the government, but at the same time, there's a, a sense of the government needs to provide and help and um, and 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 are seen as 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 thought leaders. So um so respect and influence are very big with Hispanic and Latino communities. Um, when a, a figure or someone is seen as, as an authority in something, uh, they become a trusted source of information, guidance, leadership, um, and their uh, recommendations carry weight in the community. So again, engaging uh, these leaders is just really vital to making sure that the message gets across um, uh, cultural celebrations and traditions. This is a tricky one, and I'm going to tell you why. Um, I don't think I've seen anything worse than having a looking at a campaign or an ad or um, materials or whatever it may training materials even, and seeing like a couple of maracas uh, with a Mexican hat or whatever. Um, I mean that. <laughs> When you are talking about cultural celebrations and traditions, it's really important to understand what they are, um, the significance, the importance, uh, and the solemnity that they hold in Hispanic and Latino communities. Uh, if done right, it can be a huge asset. If done wrong, it can be a disaster. Uh, but incorporating message, the right messaging into the right events uh, provides additional opportunities to connect, to celebrate the culture and ma maintain that identity. Um, festivals, like I said, I mentioned the Puerto Rican uh, parade, uh, religious events, um, having safety booths or displays at cultural events to provide educational materials, interactive activities. Those are the sort of things that if done correctly, um, I think are very, very effective. I used to live in Wheaton, Maryland. If anybody knows the area, it's very, it's a very Hispanic area, very uh, Hispanic centric. So um, they used to have, a, a, it was a, a food festival called the Taste of Wheaton. And I remember that they used to have booths where uh, different organization, government organizations were um, promoting some of their initiatives, some of their programs. And um, it was really interesting because it, they had people from the community uh, sort of engaging and giving um, their stamp of approval to these uh, initiatives, which was really, really, really helpful. And it became part of the celebration and the tradition every year. Um, and, and, and like I said before, it, it also uh, provides a sense of, of ownership and, and pride in practicing, uh, for example, safe transportation habits, at, because then they make the connection between that and the respect for their traditions and, and celebrations. Um, and then the second takeaway, which has been talked about today as well, is language barriers. Um, and overcoming language barriers, I see three things that I think are important takeaways. Um, they have to do with translation, interpretation, visual communication, and leveraging digital, digital platforms, all of which have been uh, mentioned before today. But translation and interpretation, um, obviously Hispanic and Latino communities are mostly comfortable with Spanish. Um, and some have very limited English proficiency. So accurate translation and interpretation services are crucial. And again, if done right, it's great. If done wrong, it's a disaster. Um, I saw something the other day and it, it made my skin crawl. It was an attempt at translating something. I guess somebody in an agency had to use Google Translate. And it was just really, really, really bad. Um, and that just takes away from the message, right? Like if you're Hispanic or Latino, if your first language is Spanish and then you read something that makes absolutely no sense, then the whole message is lost. Um, so accurate um, translation is, is really important. Um, and this can involve uh, hiring uh, bilingual staff like in NHTSA, they have their own staff that, that do it, or you can have professional translation services um, and, and um, consultants to make sure that you're conveying the right message. Uh, bilingual staff also serve an important 
uh, component within the organization. Uh, they can, like I said, when I was at Federal Highway, it wasn't my job to translate things, but I always was cognizant of that. And I always helped um, and facilitate those communications. If I saw that nobody was doing it, if we had to communicate with Puerto Rico and nobody really had thought about how to communicate during the meeting or a workshop or a training, I made sure that I was taking all that taking on that role uh, to effectively communicate the message. Um, also at Federal Highway, when I was in human resources, I made a mission to hire bilingual staff and I was very intentional about it. Um, it both in the internship programs, the recent graduate programs, uh, because sometimes uh, these younger um, Hispanic and Latino um, staff members were uh, the first to go to college from their, it, it, within their household. So remember I said before, like elders and, and leaders, sometimes, you know, they're really respected within the community, but, it, but it's also really important when you have a younger person graduate college and it's the first person in that household that graduates from college. Um, it's, it, it carries a lot of weight. And if you are hiring if you're making intentional decisions to have a diverse workforce, to have a workforce that represents everyone in the United States, then it becomes, they become ambassadors for your messaging, for your agency. Uh, so that's also really, really important. And I, I was very intentional in doing that uh, together with our um, DEI initiatives uh, that we had at Highways. Um, executives in the federal government, that's another issue in terms of Hispanics and Latinos. We need more Hispanics and Latinos in executive SES roles within the government. Uh, I am very lucky at FEMA that my director is, um, uh, is of Puerto Rican heritage. So she understands. She understands very well. And she has been very intentional in making sure that we have uh, our trainings or workshops when we do, when we have new guidance, that we make sure that we are um, translating those and offering opportunities for Hispanic uh, and Latinos to understand what it is uh, that, that we're trying to communicate. So uh, that has been a very good experience at, at FEMA. Um, and again, this approach of making sure that you are using inclusive language, that you are being inclusive in your hiring, uh, demonstrates that respect for, for the Hispanic and Latino community. Um, the other two things in terms of language are using, using uh, visual communication. Visual communication is so important because uh, it transcends language, right? So if you have good visuals uh, that help uh, Hispanics and Latinos understand, interpret, what you're trying to say. Family-oriented visuals are great, cultural representation and uh, clear instructional visuals that explain the things very clearly in a visual way. Those are really, really important. When I was at Highways, I remember working with a team that was um, uh, uh, putting together the, the, or was working on the manual and uniform traffic control device, devices, the MUTCD. Uh, and the MUTCD was really interesting because the first time I saw it, Coming from Puerto Rico, working in D.C., I was like, oh, wait, in Puerto Rico, we have all these signs, but we have them in Spanish. And it was a really interesting conversation uh, with the MUTCD folks on, you know, how do we make sure that the signs, the visuals that we're using, that we're using transcend language and that are easily understandable uh, to, to anybody, really. Um, and then leveraging digital platforms that has been talked about before here today, but, you know, you can have a really wide reach, uh, language accessibility, interactive engagement, um, and those ambassadors, those influencers can also share uh, our safety messages with their social networks, with their friends, with their families, with their communities. So digital platforms have become a really, really, really important way of interacting and making sure that the message can be um, heard in, and read in different languages. Um, the third and last takeaway, it's how to implement the engagement strategies. And again, this is something that has been talked about before, the community outreach. Uh, having culturally appropriate messaging and education, education and training programs. And being intentional and authentic to me needs to be at the center of the strategy. Uh, like Maya Angelou said, people will forget what you said. People will forget what you did. 
but people will never forget how you made them feel. So make make them feel part of the decision making process. Make them feel that this, this is something that they want to do by explaining the why. Um, actively engage with local community organizations. Collaborate with Hispanic fo- uh, focused. Um, uh, associations or advocacy groups. Uh, I have worked a lot with LULAC, for example. When I was at Highways, I worked with LULAC for some of our messaging. Um, so I encourage everyone to go out there and look for those organizations uh, and for those groups and, and partner with with the, with them uh, to truly connect because uh, they do have a deep understanding of the needs, the cultural values, the communication preferences. So why reinvent the wheel? If you partner with the right groups, you can tap into those resources very, very easily. Um, and then the second thing is uh, the culturally appropriate messaging, tailoring the message to the context obviously enhances the effectiveness and relevance of the campaigns, recognizing the cultural values, um, and um, language, tone, uh, visual representation, some of the things that we, we've talked about, uh, incorporating cultural symbols in an appropriate way, and storytelling. Storytelling and personal narratives, I, I think, are really, really important in the Hispanic and Latino communities. I think that's why the telenovelas are so um, famous and, and everybody watches them, just because everybody loves a good story. So utilizing storytelling techniques and personal narratives uh, from these community members to convey transportation safety messages, I think is a really, really, really strong way to connect with the Hispanic and Latino community and sharing real life experiences and testimonials. And again, I will talk a little bit at the end about a a campaign in Puerto Rico that I think is genius because it incorporates all of these things that we're talking about. Um, And education and training programs, bilingual education materials, workshops and training programs, uh, culturally sensitive training for transportation professionals. Uh, So we have bus drivers, taxi drivers, transportation agency staff. Uh, Let's give them culturally sensitive training so that they know when they encounter Hispanic and Latino uh, 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 customers so that they know uh, what to expect and how to appropriately communicate uh, with this group. Um, what else? Um, interactive and engaging approach. Again, um, having interactive interactive um, activities, group discussion, real life scenarios are a really good way to tell the story uh, that and in a very impactful way. Um, and then, so those are the three main takeaways. And I wanted to give you an example of a campaign that I think is genius. Um, it's um, from Metro Pistas in Puerto Rico. Metro Pistas is uh, the company that uh, manages, is a private company that manages our highways. And um, they have this campaign because um, motorcycle accidents have been on the rise and have, have been, it's, they're one, one of the biggest problems that we have in terms of uh, fatalities and injuries in Puerto Rico. Um, and people don't wear their helmets. Um, so the campaign is called um, Dale Casco, uh, which is genius. And I'll tell you why in a minute. But the lady that you see here in the picture, she's a real mother and she lost her son. Uh, to a motorcycle accident. So you see the slogan, uh, you see her saying how the helmet could have saved uh, her son's life. Um, you can see the pain in her face. I mean, it's a it's a very impactful uh, message. And then you have a very simple graphical representation, which is like motorcycle minus helmet equals suicide. Um, so again, I think very simple, impactful, and the and the the reason why I chose this campaign as a really good example, um, it's based on a real life story. It has the storytelling. Uh, it has the family component, which is one of the most powerful symbols in our community. The spokesperson is a mother making a plea, saying, "Don't let your passion become my pain." Um, so it's like a a, a mother in pain telling her community, her family. Uh, you know, what you do has consequences in this family. Um, it is very culturally culturally re- relevant language, play on words uh, for a Puerto Rico audience. So dale casco means 
think about it is slang for think about it, but casco means helmet as well. So it's a very good play on words, very simple to understand, uh, compelling visuals. Like I said, the motorcycle minus helmet equals suicide. Um, and then they leverage digital platforms. They have they have a whole augmented reality um, campaign around this where people uh, go to the gas stations and they there's a QR code and you do uh, everyone in Puerto Rico has like three phones. Uh, so you 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 scan the QR code and then you get augmented reality. Uh, so a lot of people are engaging with with the campaign and talking about it. So, again, I think it was very successful because it hit on all of those things that we've talked about today uh, regarding engaging uh, the Hispanic and Latino community. Gracias, muchísimas gracias por uh, permitirme presentar hoy. Uh, thank you. I have learned so much today from everyone. I hope uh, you learned a little bit from me and um, and that's all that I have today. <laughs> well, thank you very much, Jennifer. And thanks to all the panelists. Will the panelists please grab their cameras for me? Um, we are out of time and I want to apologize for going over. Um, this was supposed to end at 1.45. I know I have a few questions from some of the um, from, from some of the participants. We're not going to be able to get to them, but if you email me, I will be happy to basically at nicholas.worrell at ntsb.gov. I'll be happy to direct those questions to the panelists and we can certainly answer them for you. The one question that I saw came in a couple of times that I will ask before we close out here quickly is um, what is the difference between Latinos and Hispanics? That came in a few times, so- I can you... answer that question. Go so <laughs> Hispanics generally, we're, we're talking about, and very broadly, obviously, when we're talking about Hispanics, we're talking about people who speak Spanish. That's Hispanic. That are, that we have a common language, or Portuguese, well, it includes Portuguese as well. But Spanish, Portuguese, uh, those are Hispanics. And then when we're talking about Latinos, we're talking about Latin American, Caribbean. Uh, so that's, they're very similar, but not exactly the same. So people from Spain are considered Hispanos, Hispano parlantes, but they're not Latinos. <laughs> okay. Oh, that helps. <laughs> uh, yeah, definitely. Anyone else want to weigh in? Be... Go ahead, go ahead, Jose. Sorry, I agree, I agree with Jennifer. So Awesome, awesome. All right. Any, anyone else? Any any last thoughts by the panelists? Like I say, again, we're going to we have the recording. We'll post it out around next week. You can follow us at NTSB or various uh, social media channels for information on it. But I'll put it out there. Make sure everyone that signed up will have it as well. And like I say, you can email me and I hate not to answer questions. So please email me, nicholas.world at ntsb.gov. And I'll be happy then to funnel those questions to the panelists so that you can get a correct answer for your uh, questions. Any last thoughts by the panelists before we go? Any last, you know, Alfonso, let's start with you. Any last thoughts? <clears throat> Sorry. No, just wanted to uh, thank NTSB and you, Nicholas. And uh, please, please to everyone, we are very diverse. So we're not only one. One size does not fit all for Hispanics. So please take that into consideration. That will be my biggest take out. Violet? There's some really great resources that have been shared here and information, and I hope that you tap into the people that are here so that um, you can further your mission to reach our community effectively and to change behaviors and save lives. And thank you all for your service to our community, and thank you for being here, and thank you so much, Nicholas, for putting this together and creating a platform for all of us to share this information. Jennifer? Thank you so much for the invitation. This has been great. I learned a lot. Uh, so, and I'm at your service at FEMA if you ever need anything. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you. Jose. I just want to echo what uh, the other three distinguished panelists have said. Uh, this was an incredible experience. You never know what this will be when you walk in and you have an amazing big audience. So we appreciate you, including us. One question that I saw that came, I guess, indirectly to me uh, because of government work is the difference between an enforcement an enforcement and a social norming campaign. At NETSA, we do both because we want to make sure that our Hispanic community does listen and get word ahead of time of the campaigns where there will be enforcement involved to keep everyone safe. So for example, one quick one will be distracted driving. 
um, you drive, you text, you pay. Obviously, this in in Spanish they are a little bit different because we make it culturally relevant. But like in the social aspect of or social norming would be one call, one text can wreck your life. So that's one way we have as obligatory in the money that Congress gives us, we have to do the work and put out uh, the materials in the campaign and the PSAs for both aspects. So we are sure that all of you, our Hispanic community is safe and everybody in the country. Thank you. All right. Again, <laughs> thank you all. A round of applause to the panelists. We really appreciate you all taking it taking the time. And I hope that this is one of many conversations to reach the underserved communities, the Hispanic community, uh, one of many, you know, to come in that we might more intentionally and authentically engage with these audiences because they are part of us. So again, thank you. And you all have a blessed day. And I apologize again for going over my time. Thank you all. It was perfect. Thank you. Bye, guys. Thank you. Bye.